Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. I'm Jay Babalota. I'm the Vice President of Global Programs at Mozilla, and I'm going to be your host for today's panel. Um, we have a vital discussion planned for today as part of, of MozFest Dialogues and Debates. We're going to unpack an issue that's underpinning so many of the problems online and offline today, the relationship between AI and power. The AI in our lives reinforces historical power imbalances across gender, across race, across class. There are so many examples to list, but here are a few. Hiring algorithms prior prioritize men over women and non-binary candidates. Facial recognition systems misidentify black faces. And I would argue also that Zoom backgrounds don't uh, uh, allow for black folks to use a Zoom background without becoming part of the background as we just discovered 30 seconds ago. Um, and a year into the pandemic, we could have gotten that right by now. Facial recognition systems uh, um, and voice assistants like Alexa and Siri struggle to understand the voices of so many diasporas. AI-powered digital ads can prey on or exclude those who have the least. Um, we're going to unpack all of this today, but we're also going to ask, is it possible to mainstream AI systems, which are actually just? Um, today, I am joined by a number of fantastic colleagues. I'm really uh, honored to be on screen with y'all. Dr. Sarah Roberts is an associate professor at the University of California, Los Angeles, in the Department of Information Studies, where she serves as the co-director of the UCLA Center for Critical in uh, Internet Inquiry. Welcome. Sierra Robeson, uh, the associate director of, of the IDB Wells Just Data Lab at Princeton University, where she guides research teams in partnership with community organizations to explore how data can be retooled for racial justice. Welcome, Sierra. Julia Wono is a lawyer and the executive director of Paris-based digital rights organization, Internet Sans uh, Frontieres. Um, I made it Spanish, I'm sorry. Um, Julie, <laughs> I could have practiced that. I actually, let's go practice your French in the bathroom. Julie's work focuses on building bridges and creating channels of collaboration between various actors of the digital space to foster the development of an internet that benefits everyone all over the world. Welcome, Julie. And Nigat Dad is the executive director of the Digital Rights Foundation. Nigat is one of the pioneer women's rights activists in Pakistan and has played a pivotal role in defining the cyberspace narrative in the country. Welcome. And one last thing, we're taking questions for this panel in real time, so you can tweet them at Mozilla with the hashtag dialogues and debates spelled out. So this is a conversation I'm going to field a question to, to each one of our panelists, but to the other panelists, uh, after our initial uh, uh, panelist takes a stab at an answer, please feel free to chime in. Um, and I'll move us along by taking facilitator privilege, but um, I don't want to squash any, any conversation. So please do feel free to engage one another. Um, so let's start with some context. This panel is entitled AI and Power. Right now, who wields power in the realm of AI and who doesn't? Nigat, do you want to kick us off? Sure. Um, first of all, thank you so much for having me and having a voice from a place where we usually don't have these conversations. So. Uh, I'm glad that uh, someone from Pakistan is actually talking about AI and power. Um, and you asked the question, who actually has the power? Uh, the one group that doesn't yield any power in AI is the end user and consumer, the average internet user and netizen. Um, it, it's the user's data that, that is collected and sold. And except for the global north and a few developing countries, most users do not know what their digital rights are. And, you know, I'm, I'm speaking from the perspective and the context of Pakistan. And rarely are they enshrined and pro protected in our laws or constitution. So this collected data is fed into that databases that then targets the users through AI. Internet giants, governments, and social media companies become more and more powerful, and the average user is left with fewer and fewer avenues and way to exert their power. Uh, minus the end user, everyone in the digital ecosystem gains power through AI, 
um the only difference is that each stakeholder yields different amounts of power and control uh social media companies and tech giants have spun a deeply internet connected in, in interconnected web of data sharing that gives them immense power over the internet and internet users and now with governments entering uh this equation this power and data is also being shared with them so in usual circumstances governments are already powerful entities however when we add this ai into this equation their power increases exponentially uh data and online behavior uh, gives the government the ability to identify how to target individuals and how to control narratives online and if we go a little further in this debate of power i think it's very important for us to examine the bias in ai and how these biases mainly stem from human um, humans inherent biases the models and systems we create and train um, are a reflection of ourselves and extremely important for us to see who is designing and training ai and which part of the world you know they are designing ai be it a tech giant social media company or uh, within a government thank you nigar yeah that anybody else want to respond um I think uh one thing that I want to offer up in in into the the when we're talking about power and we're talking about bias and then also what it means for just this group of folks to be um uh having uh the opportunity for us all to speak together is um um oftentimes if if we're the voices who have to combat the bias what is it actually where are where's the original thought that and where that we actually don't have the room or the space to bring forward in that right so if the onus is on the folks who are actually bearing the brunt of that bias to showcase that bias where's the invention and the incentive um for that to actually come forward and so we're losing out twice um and and that that that's the impact of that bias on everyone um and we know that the power imbalance can't be fixed simply by tweaking code or enacting a single new law right power and inequalities are baked into the systems and the data that powers them but i'm curious about how deep the problem goes um sirak do you think you can um shine some light on it the subject for us Yeah, absolutely. First of all, thank you so much for including me in this in this conversation. I'm so excited to be here with you all. Um to get to the question, one of the things that we have to think about is how even those technologies that are not meant to reinforce power inequalities can still end up doing so. So the tools that are fundamentally built to reduce harm can often reinforce it. And one good example of this is pre-trial risk assessment tools. So algorithms judges use to determine a defender's uh of a defendant's risk of reoffense before a sentencing hearing in many states this was heralded as a solution to cash bail which many people know has lots of issues and often reinforces like income inequality wealth inequality um but they don't understand the ways in which these algorithms can also reinforce all sorts of different things. So pre-trial risk assessments were proposed as this technological solution, but those who were deemed most risky would be put in prison until their hearing and everyone else would be allowed to to um await their trial. But in the first iteration, many of these tools included race as predictive variables, many of them included zip codes, many of them included things like do you own a cell phone or do you pay rent? in their variables that they used to predict whether or not someone would be deemed risky and they people quickly realized that this produced discriminatory results so these categories were then excluded but then new categories came up as proxies for things like race and so what does all of this mean in short it means that tweaking code doesn't rid systems of bias or power instead we have to really think about what the tool, tools are meant to do at their inception and technological tools will not be able to solve social problems on their own and we really should stop asking them to do so and instead build tools from the ground up that are supposed to help the world in the ways that we want them to i want all of the um 
participate in the conversation. I um, to to um, lean into uh, being being in conversation with one. Yeah. One other. yeah. I, I just I just wanted I just wanted to uh, double down on what Sierra just said. Um, we we tend to focus a lot of the conversation recently around. AI and its biases on technical solutions, but we actually forget what Sierra and what Nigat also said previously, is that the digital world is just a mirror of whatever already exists uh, offline. So it's, um, we, we shouldn't, you know, stop ourselves from having those very serious conversations too on how racist our societies are on how sexist they are hi happy international women's day on how um you know transphobic they are and all the the, the 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 very negative things that we see reproduced online so i just wanted to to chime in and say that in this machine in in this era in which a machine is going to basically make decisions and is making decisions on human interaction and human produced content. It's really time for us to go beyond the machine and bring back the human within this, this conversation. It's absolutely important. Sarah, I saw your hand raised. Yeah, I mean, I think that's an excellent segue and I'd love to just pick that one up because, um, you know, essentially I think it's what I'm uh, uh, charged with speaking a bit about on today's panel. And that is to actually, uh, on some levels, fundamentally ask the question, what do we mean when we say AI anyway, right? So there are all these received notions right now within, um, not only within just like the zeitgeist, and, you know, within our media sphere, in conversation with each other as advocates um, and, and oft times critics, but that that question of what is AI, what constitutes AI, is in fact um, a a standing problem space uh, within computer science. Okay, both in you know in the theor in in the theoretical side of of computer science and in its application. And so um, this kind of this dilemma about what constitutes artificial intelligence was present at the birth of the field. And it was, you know, in some fundamental papers by, uh, by the key kinds of uh, uh, computer scientists of the day, you know, they, they actually stated that part of the problem with artificial intelligence precedes artificial intelligence. It's the question of what constitutes intelligence full stop what constitutes intelligence within the realm of the human and then you know if that problem or if that if that definition is somewhat fuzzy unclear contested uh then what does it mean therefore that this kind of nebulous notion is picked up and um by by uh definition abstracted and then put into implementation this was this was a an issue for foreseen uh, by the uh, by, some of the, uh, the the founders of this field, and all the way up till till today, we have um, uh, you know very important uh, kind of industry facing uh, bodies and and uh, uh, thinkers in the form of you know just the the one that's on my mind is the O'Reilly Group. Um, kind of still adequately acknowledge, you know, acknowledging, still adequately trying to define uh, what what this is, and you know, again, drawing down on this issue of what AI is. They say not only is it difficult to define, it's actually impossible to do, especially without falling into you know tautologies and in a, kind of like these self-referential, um, uh, intractable uh, circles. So I, I think it's important, as, as some of my, my colleagues have already said, that we step, you know, Sierra was just saying, we can't um, critique the AI piece if we don't really understand what the systems are that are in play and what the fundamental social issues are that are feeding into that, whether it's uh, overtly sometimes, but more importantly and more worrisome, in an insidious fashion, because we don't we don't even know how to adequately address these issues 
uh, and attend to them as a as a social collective. There are many of us who do work on them, right? But we we're in a in a fight around that, in a fight to constantly prove um, that some of these uh, social forces are at play and are causing harm. Now that gets picked up and packaged up into AI and pushed out. And I guess one of the greatest concerns there is we take these already um, very hard to uh, demonstrate systems of power and we create a huge layer of opacity around them. Uh, and then we further uh, automate them and give them incredible power to be reproduced. And so that's where we sit with AI. And the last comment I'll make about my own work and my own intervention in thinking in the space is simply um, within the realm of commercial content moderation, where we have heard for years uh, from the firms and from others that kind of the way out of the horror of doing this work and its uh, psychological consequence will be deliverance via AI and other kinds of automated uh, content moderation tools. But again, I've just, you know, I hopefully convinced everyone that what we're dealing with is a very blunt kind of instrument that mm -hmm. is in fact incredibly unintelligent in many cases. It, it will do exactly what it's programmed to do, which is often going to create more and more and new and different kind of errors. They might be different. Um, they might be errors that humans wouldn't themselves make, in fact. And so, um, you know, we have a lot of false positives coming into play here. And going back to the claim that humans would then be delivered from content moderation, what I've actually been tracking for some time is the ways in which um, AI and other kinds of automated content moderation tools actually expand the need for human intervention. Because now we need um, not only we need the creation of the tools, of course, uh, on the input side, but on the output side, we now need more and more humans to vet or even undo errors caused by uh, by AI moderation. That's in a best case scenario. In, in the worst case scenario, the errors aren't undone and all kinds of um, false positives go forward or decisions are just simply made that we can't understand or even know uh, are being taken. Thanks. So I just yeah. want to, let me, oh, Sierra, go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to echo what Sarah was saying. I really appreciate your, your emphasis on the definition of what AI actually is. And it just brought to mind that the definition of what is fair is also a contested issue and something that we should think really critically about. I mean, computer scientists have been thinking about the definition of fair for algorithms for quite some time. And, and the short answer is that there is no answer yet, but also to remember that what is fair is not necessarily just. So it's not totally clear that making facial recognition better at identifying black faces is a good thing for the world. It's not totally clear that you want police to be able to better identify people in black neighborhoods. It's not totally clear that you want ICE to um, be able to better identify undocumented immigrants. All of these things kind of come up in the definition of fairness. And, and so I think it's really important that we hone in on what we actually mean when we are talking about fairness, what we actually want to prioritize in our conversations about AI and, and power. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, yeah, I really appreciate that. And that, and also the other, this idea that it's not static, right? That it's um, in the, in kind of in, a, in the same way that, that um, uh, the shifting of power is an ever evolving possibility. The idea that even that the idea of the notion of intelligence is not fixed um, and that it's, that there's a cultural context uh, or multiple cultural contexts around what what's getting deemed intelligent and and um, the outputs and the outcomes are as uh, are leaning into all of those systemic notions as as anything else. I, I really appreciate that a lot. Um, I mean the other the other piece of it that certainly in the, in in the context of this conversation, right, is that much of the AI technology is actually tested and made. Uh, or, or made in the Western world and beta tested elsewhere. And um, there are invasive AI systems deployed at refugee camps. Uh, Cambridge Analytical meddled in African elections long before the US election, right? And so, um, so what can be done? Are there movements pushing back against this behavior? Um. I, I'm happy. I'm happy to jump in uh, on this one. And uh, for that, if you allow me, I'm just going to share 
uh, instead of having a beautiful background today, because Zoom doesn't recognize <laughs> the features of my face, I'm just going to share. I hope you can see this, um, this answer that I drafted um, regarding your, 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 uh, your, your question, which is what is being done to uh, basically prevent uh, all the bad actors from testing all this and also the good faith ones are honest to, on testing to test from to test all these horrible things on users and end users and consumers like Niga said earlier who have no absolutely no say into this conversation and for that I'd like to borrow a term that I read in a, a recent publication called philanthropy and digital civil society blueprint 2021 it was it's, uh, it was written by uh, Dr. Lucy Benholz from the D Digital Civil Society Lab at Stanford University. And it's basically, uh, I call it a Bible for all that's related. If you want to know everything about philanthropy and digital civil society uh, this year, this is definitely one place you should, you should go to. Um, and in that, in that Bible, um, there was this word that was used, global ma majority. I hate the term, honestly, global south, global north, they absolutely mean nothing. Um, but when we talk about global majority, we, uh, we, we clearly understand that a majority of those who live, those in, who live on this earth are actually, um, you know, the, well, guinea pigs, the, uh, they, they, they're just honestly victims of whatever is being decided elsewhere without ever being consulted and ever being a uh, part of the, the conversation. But at the same time, this global majority is also our future. They tell us what's gonna happen to us here in the global minority. I say here because I live in the so-called global north, uh, but I'm, I'm Cameroonian. Um, and I, I, I've seen in my work at Internet Sans Frontières, Internet Without Borders also in English, we have seen how how, uh, you know, how quick you can understand what's going to happen when you look at what's happening in places where actually nobody usually cares and specifically the media. I'll give you one example. When we started to talk about trolls in uh, following in the aftermath of the 2016 US presidential election, we actually knew that this was, I mean, we didn't know these were trolls, but we, we knew that we had seen those automated uh, automatically, um, you know, generated publication tweets uh, back in 2010 when we we're looking at what was happening in a Western African country called Gabon, uh, in which there were, you know, there were uh, rep uh, repression following um, uprising of the population in the aftermath of the Arab Spring. And to counter the narrative around what was happening and to counter the fact that civil society organizations, citizens have found a, a space on Twitter and on Facebook, Twitter particularly, to tell what was really happening in uh, a media environment that was completely locked for them. Um, well, the government, chose to buy people, well, not people, bots, obviously. Uh, I mean, we started seeing people from India or from Turkey tweeting about what was happening in Gabon while not being there. This was weird, but at the time, honestly, we didn't know <laughs> that this was, this, was a, this was a troll or you know, automated uh, propaganda. So why am I saying that global majority and global minority more than ever need to collaborate? It's because we have the knowledge in Western big academic institutions, in Western big uh, human rights organizations, but in the global majority, they have the experience in their flesh, but they cannot name that experience. They, they cannot name that what they're seeing and what they're uh, being victims of is wrong. We're talking about facial recognition, Recently, reports surfaced that in, in, in countries like Uganda, facial recognition is being used to arrest, um, you know, uh, democrat, democratic uh, demonstrators. That, that's absolutely worrying. We're also, we're also, you talked about refugees. Of course, refugees, this is a big problem. In my country, Cameroon, there's a huge refugee, well, several huge refugee crises at the same time. And we recently learned that the government accepted to sign with the um, 
I think it was the UNHCR, uh, at least a big UN refugee institution. They accepted to sign a, basically a program that would allow them to digitally trace all the refugees that come into Cameroon. It might sound appealing, especially for a Cameroon, a country like Cameroon that's already struggling with many other issues and you know, basically doesn't have the money to handle all these new refugees and all these new peoples. But what are the problems that will come after that when you start tracing the weakest? What are you gonna, gonna do later on to those, once you have tested, when you, once you have perfected your ability to trace every single moment of the life of an individual, what are you going to do uh, with those who are for now living in a more liberal, in a more liberal world and in a peaceful world? So um, this is this has been the core of my work uh, since you know working in this space, making sure that we collaborate as much as possible because there are lots of things that we can tell you, and I'm not not just Africans, Asians, Latin Americans but also trans communities, LGBT communities in general. They, they, we can tell you things, but we need to collaborate uh, with academics and with big institutions, not in an extractive way. And I'm insisting on that, but really collaborate, respecting you know, the expertise of each other. It's not because it's an experience that it's worth less. That's a false assumption that is plaguing the industry, um, but collaborate on an equal level because what I'm bringing to the table is absolutely necessary for you to make the point with your theoretical, uh, you know, frame. So yeah, that's what I I wanted to share with you today, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen. <laughs> Thank you, um, Sarah. I heard I saw your um, hand raised, and I want to also um, prompt um, the other folks in the in the conversation. Um, I I I think the that presumption of, of who has what to say and even the terminology yeah. around majority and minority. Sierra, that reminds mm -hmm. me too about the distinction between fair and just. And then Nigat, um, the, the point you uh, were making originally in terms of who's, who's articulating um, uh, their power and who has agency under the current paradigms. I mean, I think that we could kind of flip the script here and, and, and break the conversation open a little bit about around around all of that so so Sarah you had your hand open but but no I'm gonna call on the rest of you uh, uh yeah right afterwards yeah I'm gonna toss the mic to my my peers in just one second I just have such like a short-term memory problem that I want to um I want to just uh raise up uh plus one you know I get on these panels and I freak out with excitement because what people are saying is so on point and powerful. And so Julie, I think what you just said about terminology number one and about, you know, this the, the problematic relationship historically and in this contemporary moment with academia and its relationship to industry and its extractive relationship on communities is also key here to kind of uh, where we might break in and and do repair work and do new kinds of paradigm shifting um, to change exactly what you were talking about. So first of all, I just wanted to share out on the terminology piece that I once read a, 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 a just a, within another piece by a civil society advocate from uh, from India who was speaking about, you know, he, he refused to use those uh, kinds of um, received terms as well. And he, so he was talking about the overdeveloped world and I've always loved that. And so um, I kind of try to use that when I can. And I also think about uh, what we're actually talking about is resources and, and economic resources primarily. And so I think about it in terms of um, the the economic overly resourced world, you know, like like jumping off on that point mm -hmm. at, versus um, the inappropriately economically under resourced part, parts of the world. So I, I, I just throwing that out there as a as a possibility and as something that that I think about um, in terms of your you know the comments about um, who get who gets to create laboratories on other people and treat other places and 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 uh peoples as guinea pigs you know we this predates all of this this uh, computational business i always think about from my american context the interference of the american government uh in in south america and in places like chile and um 
you know, Argentina and Brazil and all of these countries that were meddled with to, um, to murderous ends. And this is a tradition in place, uh, predating AI, but certainly in place around uh, uh, picking places in the world and then going and doing stuff uh, upon them that will then come home to roost uh, in the American context. Uh, and then um, the last thing I wanted to say uh, before I b before I silence myself is uh, the the piece about uh, what you said so accurately about who actually has special insight into these problems. Who is um, most harmed are the people who have the, the solutions or at least the, the knowledge to put it into the pipeline to talk about interventions. And it was with that in mind that my colleague and collaborator and dear friend, Dr. Safia Noble and I came up with the, the UCLA Center for Critical Internet Inquiry where we put forth and put forward and put first uh, these kinds of uh, voices with all of the expertise they have because we ourselves, Safia as a, a black woman, myself as a gay woman, we understand what it's like to have the knowledge and to frankly be the canaries in the coal mine. We're always trying to bang on the window and, and tell everyone. And so that's what we're trying to actually uh, create a beacon for and to create a large enough critical mass of people to do some of that within academia specifically. I just want to acknowledge that um, some of our internet is, is um, uh, uh, more robust than others. So Nigat is going to go on audio. Um, Nigat, are you able to hear us uh, pretty well now? Yes, I can. Um, I just wanted to add um, a little bit into, into this conversation. I mean, I know we are talking about AI and power, and I think it's very important for us to focus on power, that who gets to uh, design or train AI, uh, and I think I have said a um, little bit about this, but I building on what building on what Julie said, um, it it's whose knowledge is it anyway, right? I mean, uh, the people who uh, who are in our context have so much knowledge, but there is an immense inequality of distribution of that knowledge. We are mostly used as you know inter although we have all the knowledge. And then that knowledge sort of transfers or travels to the Western world. And then, you know, that's where we see the bias. That's where the design, you know, uh, the, the design of product takes place. Uh, and instead of distribution or equal distribution of resources, we see that, you know, the inequalities, of res in inequalities between the global North and global South organizations working on digital rights or working on tech and human rights, those inequalities become wider and wider every, you know, every day. So, so, and it's, it's a lot of labor. It's a free labor, it, like sitting on panels and talking, sharing your knowledge. It's a free labor. Uh, and I think it's, it's, it's now time when we are seeing this, these conversations happening in the Western world around content moderation, how we are sharing Absolutely, have no idea what's uh, what are the decisions being taken around them while people who are sitting in these big tech giants and social media companies or you know like running governments. So I just wanted to acknowledge that there is a lot of labor happening in global south, but there is a very that labor and distribution of. You got you your audio cut out um, right right at the end there, but um, but I'm gonna I'm gonna try to recap and then uh, let us know if that I've come close. But just in terms of the the wealth of information that is extracted, I, and I'm paraphrasing obviously that is extracted like a resource um, as resources have long been extracted from the location of of that knowledge. And then there's a huge gap between then and, and, a, and, and a, um, a dearth of information of how that information even parlays into uh, uh, invention, if you will, and I'm making air, qu air quotes, um, and how it's being used. And so, so, it's, it's, hap so the, 
it's happening on two levels. There's the original extraction of knowledge, and then there's the ways that the um, knowledge is being put to use that's not even being made clear. Is that is that correct uh, on the point that you were trying to make at, right there at the end? Absolutely correct. Thank you. Okay, beautiful. Sierra, do you want to hop in there? Sure, I was just adding on to, to Sarah. I mean, at the Just Data Lab, we do exactly the same thing. And the way that we are trying to do that is literally to put in the hands of community organizations, research resources. And so we assign teams of undergrad researchers with the Princeton pedigree to these community organizations who say, you know, we really would love to know this, or we really want to advocate for this. And the students work on behalf of the organization in partnership with the organization. The organizations drive all of the theorizing, drive the data collection, drive everything. And I think it's just a really powerful way um, to make sure that the voices who need to be included are not only at the table, but are at the head of the table. They're controlling the conversation. Let's talk about that, the kinds of opportunities that you're each actually um, uh, creating and um, what you're excited about and what, like, I, I really don't want it to be that when we're having conversations of power and we have a panel of uh, women, queer women, queer people of color, that we're only talking about the power that we're disallowed or, um, and like, I know everybody here is doing incredible work and putting forward, Sierra, you just gave us a little window in, into that as well. Um, what are you excited about? How do you see that shifting? You know, when we're talking about um, uh, the analog disparities of, of power, are often upended when we come to collective purpose. So I'm curious about examples of that kind of collectivity or anything that's thrilling you in this moment. Um, if we could, if we could go around um, and and I, I know I'm I'm uh, I didn't give you warning. I was going to ask you that, but but if we can be thoughtful about that of of something that you're excited about um, and what you see as potentially power shifting in the most micro or macro way, um, I'd love. I'd love for that to be in the room and it, it, as part of the conversation. I'm gonna go around. So Sarah, you're the first uh, square in my family feud. <laughs> yeah, I feel like Brady Bunch a lot of times too with this. Okay, um, and we're all like arranged differently. But anyway, um, okay, so yeah, great question. I appreciate the, the, the context too, right? Because this isn't all about um, those of us on the panel and those whom, who we represent um just ceding power we're not doing that you know if we ever did it we're not doing it anymore and we're actually thinking through um new ways of of doing and new ways of of creating as sierra was just you know articulating and so um from my own perspective and from speaking for uh our our uh, our center at ucla one of the things that uh, Safia Noble and I are working on right now uh, actively is thinking about, a, you know, some of the projects we've had in mind for for a decade, which is um, pushing back, pushing open that public space and the public sphere that has been inappropriately colonized. And I do use that word very, uh, very, um, intentionally by tech, uh, tech having kind of um, taken up these notions that we have about so many of these information institutions that have sat in uh, squarely in uh, kind of the public good space and then colonized their words, their identities. We have Susan Wojcicki from YouTube going around the world, telling the whole world YouTube is a library. If you wanna see me go apoplectic, let me hear her say that one more time. I lose it every time. It's not, um, it's not without harm that she does that. Libraries don't collect data and, and monetize it on their users. Libraries don't uh, promote and disseminate uh, disinformation and misinformation material with, without any sense of responsibility. They don't use algorithms to serve up uh, garbage 
to just keep people engaged. None of, that is not a library. So YouTube is not a library, but libraries actually have so much to offer uh, and our ways of knowing. Libraries, a flawed institution as well with a, you know, with a difficult history, but how could we reimagine some of the principles and values that come from libraries and librarianship to actually say, not only is YouTube not a library, but this is what a library looks like um, when it is in the internet space and in, in practice for the, for the public good and for the benefit of the public. So that's just like the slightest preview of, um, and a very half-baked explanation of what we're coming up with. But what I'm saying is we're actually going to stop seeding those spaces and those imaginaries actually to tech. And we're going to reintroduce very, um, uh, very directly and with great purpose, uh, some of these identifiable information curatorial roles to help users make sense when the, the sense making has been deliberately removed from them uh, for the purposes of profit. So that's kind of where we're, we are um, in, in, in essence, um, bringing the human back and, and, and foregrounding the human in this notion of um, artificial intelligence. Like whoever said that was better, you know, um, we used to think uh, uh, sweet and low was better too. You know what I mean? It's not, it caused cancer. It's not good. So, um, you know, just, we're just thinking that way right now. Thanks. Cool. Thank you. Julie, what about you? What are you excited about? Where do you see uh, some potential and um, uh, what would make you really happy to see some momentum behind? Um, I, I'm honestly very excited about a lot of things right now when it comes to this conversation. The first thing, of course, is that my very dear colleague, Nigat, uh, she'll speak for herself and myself are both uh, part of a, a new organization, powerful organization, which is making decisions on uh, Facebook and Instagram content moderation, including the automated ones. And I'm talking here about the, the oversight board, which was, which was created almost a year ago now. And for me, this is exciting because it's honestly the first time in this industry that we are recognizing that the, the expertise and knowledge from people who we thought before, uh, you know, did not matter. Let's talk very frankly. I mean, I wouldn't, I'm a black woman. So how many chances I would have been here having this conversation 10 or 15 years ago would have, would have been very difficult. So uh, I measure, and uh, we, we, we talk about that with Nigat, um, often we measure, uh, you know, what, what we've been able to, to do, but that's not, you know, that's not the end of it all. We are here and I'm here particularly uh, with the purpose of making sure that whenever we will have our conversations about content moderation, but others in general, we will not look at people like me or, uh, you know, people elsewhere outside of the US and outside of Europe, outside of Canada, as you know, just consumers or users who we think about in the afterthought. It's a priority, it should be the principle. And the other thing I'm excited about, which is closely linked to, uh, to the one I just mentioned is that we're, I'm, I'm doing a research right now at the Digital Civil Society Lab at Stanford University and also uh, as an affiliate at the Berkman Klein Center at Harvard. Uh, what I'm working, I mean, I'm not even studying, we've developed at Internet Sans Frontières a methodology to make sure that in the automated moderation systems that platforms are rolling out as the solution to the content problems, well, we wanna make sure to get, you know, the human back into the loop. And by human, I talk here about the very specific context that is missing from most of the automated content moderation systems. And by doing that, to bring those contexts, to bring this very local knowledge, we rely and we work with, and we also, you know, collaborate, as I was saying, we collaborate with organizations in the countries where we work in. And once we work with them, we have a better understanding of what hate actually looks like in those countries, what disinformation actually looks like. When you work only with people located in Global North, 
you're going to feed databases that are filled with errors and honestly bullshit most of the times and that are even going to silence those who are actually using those platforms to bring a critical debate, a critical voice that we don't like necessarily, but that is necessary for, for many democracies in the world to flourish. And so that's the other part I'm excited about, making sure that whenever we talk about those products, uh, we will adopt basically the same strategy as the bad actors. Why not test the good things, you know, by collaborating with civil society organizations in those countries and global majority? I'm trying to educate myself too. It's very difficult. And uh, yes, that's, that's, yeah, that's the future. I'm, I'm borrowing, you know, a word here from Catherine Maher, who said that to make her work uh, so positive, heading the Wikimedia Foundation, she looked at the future and the future was Africa, Asia, Latin America. Thanks. So I, I think that's so important because so, so many times the conversation is how do we have a seat at the table and not how do we make a new table or whoever said we wanted a table in the first place, right? Like that's, it's really, really, really important to think about what, what, uh, how we build the future that we're intent upon uh, living in. Sarah, what about you? What are you excited about? What feels positive to you? I'm also so excited about so many things. And I, I told you all about the Just Data Lab and I'm so excited about the work that's going on there. Um, but in my own research, I'm also, I'm working on a project that, that explores how minority political candidates in the US experience mis and disinformation online. And unsurprisingly, it often borders on harassment. One easy example is Obama's anti-birther rumor that, that accused him of not being born in the United States, but that specifically hinged on his racial and ethnic identity. But anyway, all of that is to say that I'm really excited about a lot of the new tools that are springing up, created by women, created by people of color, created by other, other marginalized folks um, to kind of solve these problems. And I really appreciate what Julie and Sarah were talking about, about bringing the human back in. And one instrumental part of being human is the communities um, that, that we're a part of. So one of my favorite examples is Amy Zhang's Squad Box, which is a kind of crowdsourced way for your friends and family to filter out negative negativity and harassment online. And it really centers community involvement, care. And I love that these things are being in, infused into what we often deemed really impersonal, kind of objective, whatever that means, systems and tools. So I love that that's kind of being infused and, and I think that's the best way to move forward. Thank you. Nigat, what about you? Yeah, I mean, um, as uh, Julie already said that um, uh, the experience that we both are having, I think it's, uh, I'm, it's, I'm very excited. And also, you know, like it's a, it's unusual space for women like me, a woman of color, where you have like a, a powerful space where you have all the power to take decisions and mm. it's unusual for us because usually we don't have that kind of space and I, I feel that it's so important to normalize these spaces for women of color who have uh, immense knowledge around human rights and technology uh, and digital rights and we have so many women, women of color and if, even if they are part of different boards or advisory councils, how much voice they have. And mm -hmm. I think we really need to see that, you know, like how we can give them that voice. Um, and at the micro level, I'm very excited uh, around the work that we are doing in Pakistan. Uh, I'm very excited to see a lot of women feminists taking lead uh, uh, around the discourse of digital rights and the kind of feminist internet we are making here. Um, also, you know, uh, looking into the uh, issues that no one has ever looked into and then holding, you know, tech giants accountable or powerful actors accountable within the country while living in a country where in the patriarchal society, talking to a powerful state is very difficult. I'm very excited for that future, especially on this International Women's Day. I'm mm -hmm. excited to see the feminist internet, you know, not mm -hmm. just in Pakistan, but across the world. Mm -hmm. 
And, and, and the other thing I think is really important, and, I, and I'm going to tie it to one of the questions we got asked on Twitter, is that we're not talking about um, uh, only engaging something theoretically, right? Like that these ideas of a feminist internet, of a community-led internet, of, of a majority, uh, the, a global majority, right, that are actually about um, being able to build and having the capacity to build autonomy and autonomous spaces that are that are um, untethered from some from these systems uh, of of inequality and and that and that they were designed to be unjust. I mean, I think that that's the piece is that it's not that it's just broken. It's actually working in the ways that things were intended. And insofar as we hold different intentions, then we have to build for the, for those intentions. And I think that that's also a, a way that um, uh, it, that's an opportunity I'm actually excited about. So um, is that um, while certainly we see when we build unintentionally or on purpose unjustly what we what we get but that we actually do have the opportunity to build uh really specifically um in new ways and that and i have and i'm excited about that um um i think there are a lot of incredible conversations and things being built around data around data sovereignty around uh um around community access around looking at um uh um also, who's holding who's holding what data and and for whom? There's a lot there that that I feel really excited to unpack. Um, and uh, I told I told us that I'd point us to also to the rest of Mozfest. So I'm also excited the fact that a lot of what was discussed here is getting um, uh, teased out much more uh, across so many different panels and conversations and workshops and in uh, in spatial chat around Mozfest. So I really urge folks to um, to participate in those conversations if anything that got uplifted here feels particularly germane. One of the questions we got asked on Twitter, um, and I think that this is, um, uh, I'm gonna bring I'm gonna bring them together. Um, I'm gonna tell you two questions and then anybody who wants to take it, because I think we've touched on this. In what ways can we bring an intersectional anti-oppression, anti-caste lens into discussions and decisions about power inequalities in tech? Another question that came up is around um, indigenous wisdom. So community and indigenous wisdom, how do we bring that into tech, particularly in response to gendered harassment, racial profiling, or misinformation? Um, and so I'll just and then, and then the third question on Twitter was, how do we snap out of uh, the pre the predetermined um, identities some of us have been given? So, how do we actually um, upend or or um, avoid the algorithm uh, versions of ourselves that we've been ascribed? So, those are the they're small, easy questions, <laughs> but um, if any of them speaks to you. Um, um, I'd love to hear what you have to say. Julie, is that, yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I will, you know, take the most difficult one, which is related to how to make sure we're, uh, you know, bringing in entire patriarchy uh, and entire oppression views and, and, and knowledge and also indigenous knowledge. I would like to flag one uh, very important uh, procedure that exists out there. So the oversight board, which I mentioned, is a new organization which makes decision on content decision made by Facebook and Instagram on their platforms. And one of the ways, I mean, we really want to foster interaction with the public. I know the public is potentially two billion people, so it's not, you know, possible virtually, but we do have a, uh, a, a channel of communication, which is through the public comment that we open uh, for each case that we receive. For instance, we had a public comment period that was 10 days, I think, uh, for the Trump suspension account case. We received a lot, a lot of comments and many of them from Northern Institute institutions and particularly in the United States. We had another case that's related to back, blackface on, on, on Facebook 
uh, are we allowed to, uh, and particularly on Zwarte Piet, who is a traditional uh, Christmas character in the in the in the Netherlands, and who who has been criticized for a, alleged racism and blackfacing. And blackface has been, you know, recently Facebook rolled out a new policy saying blackface is not allowed anymore on its platforms. So uh, we invited public comments on that as well. I mean, in general, in all the cases that we have, public comments are really a great opportunity for us to have, you know, access to another point of view that's not from the user. That's not from Facebook or Instagram, but that's you know for from organization working on this on the on this issue, and it's it's very it's very helpful. I'll give you one example in a case related to um, uh, uh, Azerbaijan and and Armenia. There were there was a publication published during a a conflict that happened in the Nagorno Karabakh region earlier last year. And uh, we received a comment saying, telling us that, well, you know, in a case of conflict, international human rights usually allows or is more permissible with regards to using, you know, very inflammatory words, insults and all this. We did, I didn't know that personally, and I found it very compelling and helpful. So just to give an example of how we can you know, deconstruct our preconceived ideas too as uh, oversight board members and look at cases differently based on contributions and comments that we received from individuals or, or institutions. Thank you. Um, we have three minutes left, Sarah. Um, please take us, give us your response to any of those questions. Tell us which ones you're answering. Um, sure, just on the blackface uh, issue, uh, in in this book, in the English or French edition, whatever is your pleasure, uh, there is a content moderator working at Megatech who raises this issue uh, in, starting in 2012. And so there's these other points of input that we can bring to the table about who sees problems and who 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 has foresight. And commercial content moderators at firms, whether they are are located at the firms or whether they are at geographical and organizational remove as uh, contractors have incredible insight and knowledge about these things. And yet that knowledge has gone directly to the garbage can in most cases. So I, I, I wanna acknowledge the work that they do and the kinds of information they also have that has been pretty much uh, not taken up. Uh, and who does commercial content moderation? Well, it's some of the very people that we are concerned with uh, in this conversation that we've had. Um, with apologies to Audre Lorde, uh, the master's tools will not dismantle the master's house. We are in a paradigm where tech defines not only the answers, but the problems. And so what I would urge everyone to do is to um, push back on that framing and we, we will take the power to ask our own questions and answer them appropriately using the expertise and knowledge we have from our lived experience, from our communities, uh, from indigenous ways of knowing, all the places that have historically and continue to be ignored and denied. So I, I refute um, being in a space where I respond to the problems that tech creates and then asks us to fix and that also doesn't take up what we have to say, by the way. So I will say we bring, we're bring we going to bring new questions and answers, not maybe even not to the table, as you said earlier. Thank you. To another place. Right on. We're at time. So I want to give Sierra and Nagat uh, a word if you'd like to bring anything into the room. I just want to plus one everything that was already said. Right on. Nagat? Yeah. Same here. I agree to everything, whatever has, has been said. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Sierra, Julie, Nigat, Sarah, for joining us. Thank you all out there for joining us. Remember that um, power is already ours. And this is about actually um, um, stepping up uh, in, in community, in collaboration, and in purpose to exercise that power. So thanks, everyone. And see you at the rest of MozFest. <laughs>